What's up, everybody? This is the last day that we're going to be in London. This is the very end of the American Idiots Theory Underground European Tour 2024. Pip, pip, cheerio, mates. And this episode is the next one we wanted to release publicly because it is, in order of priorities, one of the most exciting things that happened while we were on this tour. We got invited to come to Ljubljana to not see Zizek by the homie Vid. He invited us to student radio Ljubljana, the oldest student-run radio station in Europe. I believe it's the second Found, oldest in the world. Founded in 1968. And uh, Vid brought us on to the radio broadcast. We got to reach dozens of thousands of offline, mostly offline people. Because of course, this is the most people we've ever reached offline. Yeah. These people are working, they're studying, they're living their lives. But for a glorious hour, they got to listen to Theory Underground spread the good word. Yeah. This was uh, really a lot of fun. Um, John was the one doing film while we were there. Uh, this is a, this is the point on the tour where he joined us. He's our documentarian. That's right. We are making a documentary about the first year of Theory Underground touring, and so coming to a screen near you sometime soon. Yeah, for real. So stay stay tuned. And with that, we're gonna roll it. Be back in the states soon. Subscribers, you have a lot to look forward to. A lot the, to catch up on. A lot to catch up on. We'll be slowly releasing these episodes of Stops Along the Tour publicly, but about half of them are going to remain subscriber only. And so if you've been following along with the tour and you want to go deep, become a subscriber. Jump on in. The water's fine. Peace. Peace. Thanks, guys. In action! Lepo pozdravljeni v daj subjekt meseca na Valovih Radio Študent. Danes v jutro gostimo Davida McCarrickerja in Bryce Ansa, glavna imena za učno, raziskovalno in založniško platformo Fury Underground. Fury Underground v bistvu za objema YouTube kanal, serije spletnih predavanj in poglobljenih diskurzijo o različnih avtorih iz polja filozofije, sociologije, psihoanalize in drugih humanističnih strok. Vodijo pa ustanovitelj David McCarricker, ki izhaja iz kritične teorije, eksistencializma in glavne fenomenologije. V svojem delu se glavnem ukvarja z raziskovanjem temeljih kontradikcij delocentrične družbe in z načini, kako razmajati zastoj strogo polariziranih kulturnih vojn, ki so obtičale v dikciji levičarstva in desničarstva. Je tudi avtor knjige Time Energy, Why I Have No Time and Energy, ki je šla leta 2023 in tudi zbornika Underground Fury, ki je šel isto leto in kjer je med drugimi prispeval svoje tekste tudi Slavo in Žižek. Hrati pa je zraven tudi Nance, ki se je projektu Fury Underground pridružil nekoliko kasneje, je pa od začetka se vzpostavil kot nepogrešljiv del ekipe. Intervju bomo pa seveda vodili v anglični. So, David and Nance, thank you both very much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Us. You've been on a book tour for uh, Time Energy since uh, April? Since Yeah, April 27th was our first event. That was the one in Paris. I think we should start with that. How has the tour been so far? It's been good. It's been uh it's been kind of kind of fast. Um we've been getting in and, and setting up events. Um, everything has been outside of our expectations, but I think in a good way. I think every time we go to an event, we think it's going to be a certain way. And we're like, oh, well, here we go. And then it's completely different than what we thought and almost always in a good way, you know? Uh, I would say the the one thing we're trying to navigate right now is that, you know, it that what we're doing is kind of like uh, hardcore music, but in, in the world of theory, you know, and we're touring because we come from that background. Uh, but it's difficult because in a, in a, in a concert, you know, people can kind of just like dance and like, there's a way to participate the whole time. And, and I think that people don't see the immediate way to participate in an intellectual artistic performance. And sometimes, and almost always, it's like the guy who's drinking just wants to interject, you know, 
and it's like I'm I'm over here. I'm uh, I I don't like sit here and do PowerPoint slides. I'm not like sitting here reading a teleprompter. You know, I'm I'm going off of the last you know twelve years of research and and lectures and and the books and and I'm tying together essential threads, but I'm mediating that with the audience that is engaged. And I'm seeing if people are following and if, and if they're checked in, then I'm, I'm good and I'm, I'm able to work with that. But if it looks like some people aren't able to follow, then I'm, I'm going to have to kind of change it up as I go. And so we've been talking about how it's almost like we have like this moving set list. It's not decided right before the event goes. It's actually kind of decided during the event because, yeah, there's like a hundred different ways of going about it. But we end up going one specific way depending on the the kind of audience that we have because sometimes it's younger people, sometimes it's older people, sometimes they're academic people, sometimes, uh, you know, people come from lots of different walks of life. But it's always these... Dr- Am I allowed to swear on the radio? Yeah, of course, of course. It's always course. these drunk motherfuckers, though, <laughs> who are, like, trying to interrupt and derail. But outside of, like, little hiccups along the way with stuff like that, no, it's always just been absolutely wonderful. We're really honored and we appreciate deeply all of the people who've really rolled out the red carpet for us in Europe and made it possible for us to be here. And we feel extremely welcome and grateful. So, first of all, tell me a bit about Fury Underground. Like, how did the project come about? I know that you started out as a video essayist and then you moved on to a different format. But Fury Underground seems like to be a lot of different things right now. It's it's both a YouTube channel, it's a podcast, it's a uh, learning platform, it's a social media app. So, what's the what would you what would be your layman uh, response? Yeah, it's it's really easy for someone to come to it through one of the platforms that we use to promote it, and then think that what what Theory Underground is all about is basically its presence on that platform, whether that's YouTube, podcast, Substack, what have you, Instagram. Some people only know Theory Underground from its Instagram, and then they come to an event and they're like, oh, there's all this other stuff. But yeah, no, I, what I say is that it is a, a a teaching and publishing platform for my continued research. This is, in a sort of sense, supplementing my dissertation research. I chose, instead of doing a PhD, after my master's, I decided, no, I'm going to do this instead. And for a while, I was really just doing stuff with a YouTube channel, and so I think that I had a bigger presence on there. You're right, I was doing stuff like video essays and things like that. But no, the now YouTube is simply part of the media arm of Theory Underground. And the real stuff going on, like the realist, is in the ongoing research seminars and the lecture courses. And we have lots of amazing... Um, guest lecturers who also participate. That's what I wanted to ask you about, uh, specifically what kind of lectures you uh, host on your platform. Well, the most recent one we just had was Dr. Leon Brenner. Uh, we met, we just met with him in Berlin, actually, and interviewed him for the documentary uh, about this tour. But uh, Leon Brenner, he's a psychoanalyst, and he wrote a book called The Autistic Subject, And uh, so he's he's working in the world of psychoanalysis, and he's saying, like, look, historically, people have completely misunderstood autism. You know, we've we've made significant advances in autism research, especially because we've been listening to people with autism, um, and uh, and so he's uh, reconceiving the clinical structures of psychoanalysis. And so he did a, a short course at the Underground on that topic, which relates to one of the major research threads at Theory Underground, which is Critique of Libidinal Economy, CLE. And so Critique of Libidinal Economy is very important, but so is Critique of Political Economy, CPE, uh, Critical Media Theory, CMT, Critical Doxology and Time Energy, CDT, etc., etc., etc. We have all of these different research threads or lines of thought or or, or fields, really, that are opening up. And um, pr- various professors will come, and I only bring them if I think that I have a lot to learn from them. Uh, and so Todd McGowan will be teaching Lacan Seminar 11 in July. Um, my friend uh, and fellow traveler from the last 12 years, Brian Weeks, is going to be teaching a course, Introduction to Ivan Illich, who's like, not most people don't know about Illich, you know. We actually had a show about him like two weeks ago. No, here. no way. Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. So that you're way ahead of the curve then in that sense, but um, 
the, the way I usually say it is that, you know, when people think about the critique of the schooling system, they think of people like Bell Hooks or Paulo Freire, uh, or when they think of the critique of institutions, they think of Foucault or Habermas, and what everybody's missing is Illich, you know, because he's absolutely essential for both that schooling thing and as well as the institution approach. And so... Uh, we've got a bunch of other courses. I'm not going to sit here and plug every single one of them. Yeah. But uh, some, so sometimes these are close fellow travelers like Brian or Mikey. Mikey will be teaching Intro to Zizek. Uh, or sometimes they're more like these, these uh, sort of kingpin guys in the theory scene like Todd McGowan or Chris Catrone, you know. And so all of them being able to participate, it's a way of them educating me in the things that I think I need to understand to be able to do the research I want to do. But then I bring along my subscribers my students, and uh, that's Nance is ultimately the the representative Theory Underground subscriber and student who's here on the tour. Most of them obviously can't make it. Some of them will make it to one stop here or there, but Nance is actually able to be there the whole the whole way through. So you guys teach everything from you know um, Nick Land to to uh, Illich to psychoanalysis and classical sociology and everything like that. So. I was basically wondering what kind of audience do you guys strive to um, not satisfy, but you know, kind of appeal to, or what what kind of listener base do you hope to kind of attract? I mean, I I, I assume at this point that anybody who's into theory underground is probably between the ages of like twenty eight and forty five. Um, that's not always the case. I have uh, people who are 18, 19, 20, as well as you know, 60 to 70. But the majority of, of Theory Underground students and subscribers are in their 30s and are burnt out on their educational path. Uh, and so I always say it's, it's high school dropouts, workers with earbuds in the U.S., and post-grad European burnouts. Like that's pretty much what it is. I, mm -hmm. So the, it's always like these post-grad European burnouts and then like these, these people who never even went to college in the US. You guys have a, or used to have a very precarious uh, financial situation. I know that uh, you worked at Amazon. Yep. Uh, and Nancy also did some odd jobs here and there for a lot of time. So what I'm interested in is How? What was the experience? In, what was the experience like launching Fury on the ground and evolving it while you had to work at Amazon and had all of these other liabilities? Yeah, yeah, like this book right in front of me, Time Energy, right, which you shouted out in your introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I wrote it while at Amazon, you know, and uh, I only quit two months ago because uh, I think it was in December of 2023, I announced, I really want to quit this job uh, before the tour. And uh, so I'm rolling out the subscription model, people who want to be involved with the ongoing research and do monthly things with us, um, please become a subscriber. And thankfully, I was able to get just enough that I could supplement or replace that uh, the income that I was making from Amazon. But I was already just doing part-time at that point. You know, uh, before that, though, when I was, for instance, when I wrote this book, I was full time and it was a graveyard shift, which was 13 hours uh, per night for uh, three days a week. And I was doing that shift because, you know, in terms of time and energy, I, I was like, well, look, it's going to be brutal no matter what. But why work four 10 hour days when I could work three 13 hour days, you know? And, and yeah, it was a graveyard shift, so it was pretty brutal. But then you just sleep it off. And, uh, and I would, I would usually, because, you know, it's three days on, I would, with these four days off, outside of the couple days catching up on sleep and readjusting, I seem to have more time and energy than with almost any other kind of job schedule that I've ever had. And I've had a lot of jobs. I've worked several areas of the construction um, fields of, you know, food service, uh, grocery stores, department stores, gas stations, whatever. And uh, no, I, I, I think Amazon's actually, in, in a lot of ways, way more progressive than uh, a lot of the jobs that I've worked. Um, and I think, ways. and I say this, Temp this is temporary. Like yeah. this is temporary. I think that Amazon has done a lot to make up for its bad repu reputation. 
you know, because its media image is obviously so negative. Um, but it's I mean, in the most obvious way, it is progressive because it has rainbow, you know, flags and <laughs> and people have their pronouns on their pins and blah blah blah, um, which is hilarious and and not and it's and I think most people probably think that's disingenuous. A handful of people probably feel some kind of huge payoff from it, like oh, I'm I'm so represented here or something. But I think most people kind of just whatever. But no, it's it's progressive in the sense that from the beginning, when you start working there, you start out with uh, I think it's 15 hours of paid time off, meaning that you can just clock out anytime you want to and just walk out of there. You don't even have to talk to a manager. You can just walk out. And so there's that. And then there's also the fact that. I was taking three bathroom breaks per hour, often, you know, anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes. Man, that's a lot of time I was stealing, and nobody ever came to talk to me about it. Whereas if I tried to do that at a restaurant or in the construction industry, I would be in so much trouble. And so, you know, I have Jeff Bezos, you know, trying to save face to thank for paying me to write and research this book, basically. Yeah, so you can shit on company time mm -hmm. and get away with it. Exactly. Exactly. We always say, uh, Bezos makes a billion, I make a dime, that's why I shit on company time. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about time energy, which is a pretty important concept for your research as a whole, and you also wrote an entire book about it. So what is, in layman's terms, what is time energy? And why yeah. is it relevant? So I'll, I'll say the short version, and then I'll kind of like talk about the research that went into it a little bit. But the short version is that time energy, the strict definition, is it is large energy-infused repeatable blocks of time reliably between us. And the point is, is that nobody has that. And because nobody has that, everybody beats themselves up for failing to follow through on building the relationships or skill sets, cult discovering or cultivating the talents um, that they feel they should be able to do to be a full human being. And every New Year's, people make these resolutions. Oh, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll be so much better. And then a month later, they burn out. And why? Why are they burning out? And I say it's kind of like when you go to a like a buffet for food and you put too much food on your plate and then you you realize, oh, my stomach my stomach was was smaller than my my uh, my taste buds, right? Or my imagination. Well, the same thing is happening every New Year's. People are saying, "Oh, you know what?" They they look at the calendar and they sit there and they think, "Well, I technically have all this time, so I should be able to practice the violin and exercise and do this and that and read books and have relationships." and And so people are sitting there trying to do their time management thing. But what they forget about is that time is nothing without energy. Time without energy is garbage time. And uh, energy without repeatable, reliable time between us is also worthless. And I use this, this, I, this, uh, this stipulation of between us because time energy is not something that's inside of you or me. Energy and time are outside of us, right? It's between us. Like, yes, of course, there's like you as an individual, you might lack the energy to do something. But when we set a deadline to do something together, a lot of times the energy uh, towards that goal, it comes rushing in like last minute before the actual deadline. And that's not just from inside of you. It's because the deadline is something that's between us, right? It's something that we've all agreed upon. And it's something that in some way we're all committed to it. We share it. And so time energy is the commons, right? But so is necessary labor. Right, and so every society, it, there are certain things that have to be done to be able to reproduce it. Uh, we always say, you know, Taylor Swift bobbleheads are those necessary? Are factories that are making that necessary? Probably not. Uh, but but clean water, yeah, that's necessary. And then there's like gray areas, you know, d d smartphones and, and Legos. Do those count? I mean, people probably want them. Air conditioning, I think we probably want that. Uh, but necessary labor is just speaks to the fact that th somebody's got to make it happen. Anything that we rely on, it, down the line, there's all these people in the production process. And the necessary labor that we presuppose when we order stuff off of Amazon or what have you, that that's part of the commons too. And so in a society that has the potential to use automation to replace 
a lot of the shitty jobs and abolish most of the bullshit jobs. Um, necessary labor is something we need to be thinking about in reference to time energy. And we need to be thinking about time energy because what we have and what we are accustomed to is existing as labor power. We exist as just being on call for the market as labor power, which means that we don't really have time energy. We don't have large energy infused repeatable blocks of reliable time uh, between us, right? Because it's been turned into labor power. And that the schooling system itself is not meant to teach us to love the liberal arts, unless you're very privileged, you know, if you're lucky, then that's fantastic. But for most people, it's to teach you to realize, oh, you don't deserve to make a good salary or if you were really good at it, then you do deserve the good salary. That's like the implicit message, right? And uh, so we kind of lead with things like the liberal arts and, and the various things that people make resolutions about every New Year's because the point is to say those should be human rights and you should be able to pursue those things when you want to. Um, and, and, and it would be a happier society if everyone could. Right? But instead, we're all turning ourselves into labor power. The whole system reduces us into that, meaning that we have nothing but time without energy or energy without reliably repeatable large blocks of time between us. Right. So you also have a lecture series, or rather an exegetical a reading series of um, Capital from Marx. Yeah. I, I was wondering, what is your relationship to Marx's thought, the Marxist canon, and how does time energy fit into that? Cool. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that I'm saying labor power, I owe that to Marx. Right, yeah. Uh, Angles, I think, in the mm, forward or preface or something like that to volume two of Das Kapital, he says that it was the... Um, the, the, the labor power itself as a concept was... Engels says this. Marx's uh, most innovative concept that solved for a lot of the problems that the classical uh, political economists were stuck in. Uh, so, you know, th there is that. But for me, I read Marx through his, his early work, which is problematic, and we can get into that. Marxists, some of them, have a problem with that. That's fine. But I can't really help with what I read that got me into all of this stuff, and it was A Strange Labor, which is a fragment from the political and economic manuscripts of 1844. And in A Strange Labor, Marx talks about the how, how you're, you're... I mean, the short version of it, you know, as an example, is that the person who works in the Nissan factory in Aguas Calientes, Mexico, spends his or her whole life making these Nissan cars and will never be able to own one of those Nissan cars, which is to say that the product of that labor is being alienated from the producer. That's a strange kind of thing because, you know, for most of human history, outside of slavery, humans directly consume the things that they produce. There are Various forms of alienation, some are arguably good, like being alienated from your, uh, from your lower self or alienated from the, a tradition that was going to restrict you from being who you want to be or, or whatever. But the kind of alienation that gets in the way of being able to be a human being is not having any say over the production process, not being able to have access to the product of that process. And then most importantly... Uh, Marx talks about species being. You're alienated from your species being. And a lot of people misinterpret this to just be like, oh, you know, they're thinking in strictly Darwinist terms, you know, because they know that Marx is a materialist. But they miss the ter the, the actual, the, he uses this term uh, in, in the, the Strange Labor. He talks about, what is the term here? Spiritual nourishment. Spiritual <laughs> nourishment. Yeah. So spiritual nourishment. Well, what is spiritual nourishment? It's the ability to essentially digest the broader world that you're in, which is uh, spiritual in that sense of Geist, which is that German word for not really woo-woo spirit, but we're talking about like the cultural liberating arts of understanding and, and of expression, right? So understanding and expression. And, and, and so being a, a human being in some sense would mean... Being in the world, you are interpreting that world. You're trying to understand that world, uh, and uh, and you get to express yourself 
in the context of understanding it. But, uh, that, that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. Humans have always been around the campfire interpreting the world and, and, and mythology and philosophy and religion and science and art used to all kind of be blended together. And then, of course, in modernity, they're all hyper-specialized and separated from one another. But the point is, is like, uh, this specialization, though it's good, also means that you spend your whole life understanding one thing in a super instrumentalized way. And outside of that, you, you know nothing about your world. And I think that the internet and uh, sort of this post-specialization gigified world that we live in where workers with earbuds are tuning in to us reading Capital Mondays is part of like us as a human species pioneering a new phase where that specialization is kind of like, bye-bye, it's going away. And, uh, and yeah, Marx is absolutely essential for all of that. How do you think online political and philosophical, theoretical discourse might change in the coming years, seeing as, me personally, I think that the video essay as a form is so completely oversaturated and kind of beaten to death that we're sort of due for a, I don't know if a, if a new form of, you know, media or anything, but like, I don't think it's 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 going to, to last much longer in, in, in this state where it is right now. So, so what are your thoughts about it? Do you think that like the internet might might kind of actually create some more niches, like for example Fury Underground, which is like it's 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 a remove remove community. It's not like exclusive or elitist, but I'm not gonna stumble upon it with millions of views, you know, no. on the internet or something like that. So what do you think is gonna happen on that front? The program will resume shortly, right after this DIY commercial that is not for any sponsor other than ourselves. Thank you for watching. Whether we are already fully in the grip of the techno-capital AI singularity or not, we likely feel as though there's not much we can do. As allies of future generations, we aren't giving up so easily. To quote the author of Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. We wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what our life and our children's lives may be. This fear is not new. The question of technology, media, and institutions became unavoidable in the 20th century. Yet when we think of institutions, the most radical critiques people have encountered came from either Michel Foucault or Jürgen Habermas. These thinkers towered over the theory seen in the 1970s and 80s as radicals took their long march through the institutions. When it comes to theories of social change, the tendency is to put our hopes in leaving the existing institutions, the current order failing, or some overnight revolution to bring us salvation. Otherwise, we lean in and do the best we can with what's afforded by the existing institutions. Reform or revolution. Nothing ever changes, so we keep putting our hopes in education. So progressives say, if only more people had access to better education, then that would solve the problems. But they have not thought seriously enough about the nature of our institutions, or this thing called education, that they offer. The most radical critiques of schooling that teachers encounter issue from Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks, and Henry Giraud, but none of these ever got to the root of institutions themselves. The theorist who did this was Ivan Illich. Gaining brief stardom in the 70s, Ivan Illich was the father of the de-schooling movement, inspiring hundreds of radical schools and generations of homeschooling parents. But this characterization of his work as the anti-school guy was his ultimate demise. But that only takes account of a surface level of his work. Illich was immediately misunderstood and quickly abandoned. The issue goes far beyond schools. We spend our entire lives mediated through institutions that totalize, instrumentalize, and reduce humans, all of our possibilities, to something predictable, calculable, and exchangeable, easy to control. The interests of state and capital here overlap entirely. Our desires are thus turned into commodities and our time energy into labor power. Illich doesn't stop here, though, for institutions are not the whole picture. When people think of schooling today, they think of studying for exams not learning for the sake of learning. 
When people think of hospitals, they think of treating illnesses, not human to human care and well being. When people think of transportation, they think of speed and efficiency, not the possibility of sustained, regular, and meaningful connections. When people think of reading, they think of collecting information, not lingering with an idea. The move from schooling to school A requires serious inquiry into the conditions of possibility for this mode. I'm calling for a sincere and earnest revival of Illich. While most introductions to Illich limit their engagement to his earlier works, a series of polemics against schooling and institutionalized consumer society, I want to go deeper and lead us to a more robust understanding of who and what a human is for Illich. With his help, we will reopen the question of what we are, what we can be, and the types of lives we are willing to give our time and energy to bring into being, if there are to be humans in the future. This course begins on June 13th and goes through July 4th, 2024. It meets on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can enroll at theoryunderground.com forward slash courses forward slash illich hyphen one or just click on the link in the description. For those who just want to spend a month really thinking about schooling and institutions, this is a fantastic way to do so. But for those who are looking to go deeper with a community of truth seekers who are going beyond the current theory scene to form an intellectual milieu, this is a fantastic way to do so because the Theory Underground 2024 conference at the end of October 23rd through 27th is going to have special panels for presentations related to this course. Any student of this course will have opportunities to present and those presentations can ultimately culminate in submissions that may be accepted into the anthology we are doing on the critique of schooling and education to be published either at the end of this year or at the beginning of 2025. Thank you. We hope to see you there. Your thoughts about it? Do you think that like the internet might might kind of actually create some more niches? Like for example, Fury Underground, which is like it's 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 a remove remove community. It's not like exclusive or elitist, but you're not gonna stumble upon it with millions of views, you know, no. on the internet or something like that. So, what do you think is gonna happen on that front in the coming years? No, I think that for the next twenty to you know fifty years. Uh, the people who are already big video essays could keep doing what they're doing and a handful more could join their ranks. Uh, and, you know, there will always be small knockoff uh, channels trying to do something similar. Uh, and that's, I don't, I don't know that that will go away, though, of course, there could be significant changes in the medium. Uh, YouTube could completely become, like, uh, useless for, for, for people who are doing this kind of thing. Uh, podcasts, who knows? Maybe people will get bored of them. But I kind of don't think that they're going to go away. But I think that they are leaving people wanting more. That's the main thing, is that I think people want something more. And maybe not in replacement of all of that, but they want something more. And I think that the people who are influencers, the people who are making video essays, the people who are doing this kind of stuff need to realize that they aren't the last step in the pipeline and that there needs to be real places for people to go to take on their own educational journeys. And so I want to actually toss this one over to Nancy because he said similar similar sounding things to what you were just saying there. So yeah, maybe a little bit about your own experience getting into Theory Underground. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> being um, disgruntled, malcontent, um, former radical who's also like a family man and trying to hold it down and, and work and hold jobs, but like still clinging to some idea of, of the left or emancipatory politics or whatever. Um, for the most part, I did consume left media. So bread tube and, and video essays and reading books and shit like that. But it, it, it was hollow and it did leave me wanting more. And it reached a point where uh, I was kind of confronted with myself where it was like, you can either continue performing 
that you are this radical or, or that you really do hold these beliefs um, or, you know, give it up and, and just fully give yourself over to the career, fully give yourself over to um, growing up, if you will, or, you know, as people would say. Um, and I think it will come to that. I, I think algorithms will replace most influencers and, and content creators. Mm. Um, like AI and everything. Yeah. Um, but there's like there's always going to be this superficial, spectacle, performative level. But I do genuinely believe that more and more people are waking up to their own like mm -hmm. discontent with that um, and seeking out new experimental learning web type shit. I would like to see an AI app developed that would watch these videos instead of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like just skip the jouissance and everything. Like <laughs> that's it. I, and, you know, I, I do that. I have I have robots read books when I'm away from my computer. Of course, I am recording them doing that, and then I have the MP3 and I can listen to it later. But there is like this weird sort of uh, interpassive enjoyment that I get from walking away from my computer while it's still working. It's right. like, oh, I'm exporting three videos and podcasts, and they're also uploading, and I'm also recording this, you know, forty hour book, and uh, and and then I, I go, I go, and I I just chill, and I'm like, ah, oh my gosh, I can relax, you know. But uh, I think I think part of what we've been saying though is that with the world of of podcasts and video essays, um, there's there's so much for people to go through and usually they'll spend anywhere between a year and 10 years grinding through whatever the scenes are that they're interested in. But it is opening up these sort of doorways in the life of the mind. The thing is, is those become desires and those desires have needs and those needs, if they go unfulfilled, are going to leave you feeling very frustrated. And of course, because people don't have time energy, those needs will go unfulfilled. And so part of what we're doing is saying, look, you got to find a way. You've just actually got to make it work. And maybe you can't right now, but maybe you will find uh, a work-life balance in the next year to five years where you can. But the thing is, is to start thinking towards that, because what if you did get a year off that was paid? What would you do with it now? And a lot of people don't even know. You know, if they won the lottery, it would ruin their life. But if you love philosophy and theory and you have a huge research program and your job is in the way and then you won the lottery. No, it's not going to ruin your life because you've got more interesting things to do than, than you know, waste that money on whatever, whatever. And so the exegetical reading sessions, going back to that, because you were talking about Capital Mondays and the, the reading marks, uh, these are an experiment of what we can do with the medium to sort of show people there's something more to books than constantly thinking, oh my God, there's too many for me to ever get to. And and then when you finally do get to sit down and get to one, of the, I guess the first one on your list or whatever, you, you try to read a page and then you get super distracted and you're like, I have to go back to that paragraph and you just keep reading it over and over again. There's more to life than that. That is not reading. That is what we've been taught is reading. And and in the schooling system, like if you have an exam and you're up against that and and you're and you're you're kind of gutting the text in preparation for that exam, uh, whatever, you know, sure, but we don't know about how to leisure read. And thousands of years of human history shows us that leisure reading is not done silently in your head. It's not that's a that's an invention of modernity, and it's not the worst invention ever. But Thomas Aquinas was renowned for his ability to read in silence, right? Like all the other monks were like, that guy's a genius, man. He can read quiet just in his head, you know? Well, what is that? <laughs> what I'm saying is that for thousands of years, the, the, the approach to reading is like one person sits there and reads, and everybody sits there and listens, and maybe they take turns, and of course, back before the invention of the printing press, you know, the person who's reading, everyone else is sitting there like writing it down. If uh, they're literate. If they're literate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're, they're called scribes because they are uh, reproducing the text. Oh, right, okay. Right? Yeah. But then the exegetical, in this traditional sense, is when the teacher or whatever, stops uh, reading the, let's just say he's reading the Bible or something like that. He stops reading, and so they stop 
you know, taking, because the, the, they're sitting down writing down every word to reproduce the text because they don't have the printing press, right? So they're writing it down on scrolls. Well, but when he would stop reading and look up and say something about the reading, that's called an exegetical, right? He's doing exegesis. And when you're doing exegesis about the text, it's like a commentary on it. You're offering context on it. You're raising important questions on it. You're saying this person, that person, these people, that school, they interpret it this way, but the way that we're approaching it, look at the, look at it this way. You ever think about it like that? You should be watching for this and that. That's an exegesis. And uh, the, 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 the scribes who were sitting there writing down verbatim everything from the original, while the exegesis is going on, they're over here writing a, on a different scroll, which is going to become like a secondary text or a commentary on the primary. And so what do we do, Nance? <laughs> I think we, uh, we try our best to kind of uh, approximate the same activity. Like when we're reading Capital, for instance, we'll sit and the majority of the time, it's the words on the page. And then when we do go off, when we do interject or ask questions or bring in added context, we have shared notes documents where we're literally like paragraph by paragraph, line by line, um, creating like a, a shared notes document. So we have our own version of this exegesis. And, and when we do it on YouTube, we don't always do it live. Um, there tend to be one or two people who are following along and they leave essays in the comments section. And, yeah, and, really, really good engagement. Yeah. Um, Quality over quantity, that's for sure. Mm. That's the thing is we're resisting the imperatives of the algorithm. Right now I've got all these friends who they still do the video essay thing and they or they have a podcast and they have this insane pressure under them to truncate everything, to keep it short as possible, to edit everything out, to keep it nice, short, and punchy, and uh, to keep it flashy, keep it interesting. And we're like, man, fuck that. We're going to be boring. Because <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you aren't committed to this already and you want flashy stuff, there is so much stuff for you on the internet. But if you're wishing you could be doing what we're doing, then we don't have to apologize for going for 10 hours. Mm. Right. And talk, talk a little bit about the longer form content as well and, and, and how you felt about that as a worker, you know? Um, yeah, like when I was driving trucks and cleaning toilets and, and all that um, and using primarily YouTube as a podcast platform because that's just whatever. Um, and I wanted like a, a six hour video as opposed to a 20 minute or even a 40 minute video essay. Because when you're working, you, you have to put your shit down. You have to clean your hands. Um, every time the video is over. But if you have a long stream or a long video, it carries you through the day. So when you're doing work, when you kind of dissociate your body from your mind and your body is completing work tasks and your mind can really study. Um, so when we're doing our 10 hour or, or our 12 hour or our 17 hour live streams, <laughs> we are keeping 17? these. Yeah, yeah, that was the most recent one. No, that wasn't an exegetical though. <laughs> That would have been too much yeah. for an exegetical. I, so, like, the longest streams I do are, like, are these epic marathon streams, but that's where we bring on guests throughout the day. Right. And so it's, like, every hour and a half to every hour, there's a new guest on, and we're interviewing them. And if they're not randomly selected, they are chief in the scene for various reasons. I'm bringing them on because they somehow relate to something we've been talking about, and probably they relate to the other interviews that day. <coughs> and so, no, the... The last one, right before we left for tour, was a 17-hour stream. <laughs> yeah. You guys often talk about developing an intellectual milieu, in, um, unlike an intellectual scene. Mm. How would you basically define the difference? What, what are the <coughs> qualitative differences between having an intellectual scene, maybe a reading group, or having, developing a proper milieu? So when I think about, and I'm sorry about my <clears throat> this frog in my in my throat, it happened during our September October tour in U.S. when we went to like 17 different cities for the book tour uh, last year. Uh, I just lose my voice, like I always lose my voice and get this cough, like every tour, and it's why I never became a vocalist. But a scene, you know. I, I, going back to, I, I never became a frontman in a band. Well, all I ever was was a scene kid in the music scene. And 
that's because I couldn't be a front man and that's what I wanted to be. I made excuses. I probably could have found some way of doing it, but the that's a normal thing. It's normal to get involved in a music scene and kind of just show up and kind of be there and you you make friends. You know, you start to call those friends your family, maybe even, uh, and and maybe these are people you party with. You talk about music, talk about everything, and when it's your scene, that means you go there not just for the big shows. Uh, you go there before the show starts. You stay after the show's over. Um, some cities don't even have a scene. Some people go to the music and. You know, they go to this or that concert or whatever, but they've never experienced belonging in a scene. Or or maybe they got a little taste of a scene and they realized they don't belong in that scene and they felt like it was very exclusive or whatever. And that's because the scene is the place within which affinity groups form, right? Well, the theory scene, going off of this metaphor, is a place in which affinity groups form. And that's usually on someone's Discord you know, through their Patreon, like whatever, whatever people have various ways of getting involved with these various, they call them communities. Well, a scene is cool and being a scene kid is great, but do you ever want to just like, I don't know, start a band, like learn how to do it yourself? Like that's kind of the idea is like, hey, you know, there's a lot more people who are just like in the scene than actually like learning the instruments. And part of the our hardcore roots you know, all of the kind of music we enjoy owes so much to these artists from the 70s and 80s in the U.S. who who said, hey, we're going to push the medium. We're going to experiment with what can be done by people who don't even know how to play this stuff. And we're just going to we're going to we're just going to go out there and do it. And we're going to connect with people because fuck these giant rock festivals for, you know, our their parents generation is sold out. And they were like, no, that, that's not going to do it. We don't want the glory of being rock stars. We want to just be able to have a lot of fun and connect at this local level. And so you had bands like Minor Threat and Black Flag. Like They would go to uh, a town way out of the way. There, It was just a loss. They weren't making money to go to that town, but it was just to connect with a handful of people, right? And we take that sort of ethos into everything that we're doing here. But the idea of a milieu... No, I think that there were definitely like hardcore milieus. We could talk about that. And that's, you know, in a real hardcore milieu, everybody was in a band. Everybody was experimenting all the time. And you had different localized ones. Like Name DC, of- San Francisco, Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the world of uh, intellectual things, the life of the mind, right? We were just in Austria. There's the Austrian uh, school of economics, or there's the Vienna circle in philosophy, the, the logical positivists. Uh, there's the, I mean, Marxism, that's an intellectual school. But, the, you know, it, we're from the United States. Transcendentalism, pragmatism, those count. But before that, empiricism, rationalism, um, these, these, these are not just ideas that come down from the sky or from someone sitting in isolation writing by themselves. Uh, this comes in the great the great man theory approach or uh, to history, of course, would just say, well, you know, you have modernity, it's going to be Descartes, and then it's Leibniz, and then it, you know, and that's what they're going to do. But no, these people come out of rich and robust, dynamic intellectual milieus, probably where they were meeting with other people several times per week. Um, reading one another's writings, uh, writing letters to one another after reflecting on things for a couple of years sometimes after being apart. Um, And that sort of back and forth, that interplay, that rigorous thinking with one another uh, is always, always the precursor to the development of any sort of intellectual milieu, which is the precondition for any kind of genuine new movement to come about. And right now, everybody wants a new movement. Everybody wants to jump the gun and go straight into organizing the new movement, but they haven't taken the time to to actually tarry with the failures of the last couple centuries and to think about, like, yeah, a lot of these theorists that come before us got a lot right in diagnosing the situation. But the situation has changed and these motherfuckers were probably wrong at the time at the inception of, of the of their theories so it's on us to be like where were they right when were they wrong how was the situation correct as they diagnosed it at the time how has it changed to you know where we are today 
and and what are the main, most essential uh, and pressing uh, things that we have to understand if we are to really re-diagnose the currently existing situation. And we're, we're of this position, and this is maybe controversial, but like real art and real political organizing can't really do its thing until we've reconceived the situation. And right now, uh, people, if you start studying philosophy or theory at the university, everyone says, oh, well, what are you going to do with that? Or, or like there's like this crazy pressure to instrumentalize it towards something. Oh, well, how's that going to change the world? Show me, show me, show me. How does that translate into politics right now? And it's like, what we advocate for is a time of moratorium that comes from burning out. Once you've burnt out, once you realize that the various things that you've tried to do aren't working, instead of just sitting around and, and complaining about what everyone else is doing, roll up your sleeves and get to work trying to understand the situation anew. And so we call that a, a period of moratorium, right? Is this a nihilistic phase? Hmm. Short term, yeah. But it's a, would, would you say it's a necessary phase to kind of, you know, get over your maybe naive precognitions about political organizing to kind of just just kind of screw everything and become a nihilist for, you know, a duration until you kind of develop a new maybe system of thought, maybe you kind of get rid of some of your, some of your early dogmatisms and then you kind of mature into, you know, something that can supersede all of that. I would say that nihilism carries a lot of connotations and that the basic level where I, I can see you're coming from here, I would say just, yeah, for sure. In, in the sense that it's pessimism. In the sense that it's pessimism, right? We're, we're done? No, no, no. Oh, okay. We're still rolling. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so yeah, no, like nihilism in the sense of pessimism, sure. But uh, in the sense that everything's meaningless, uh, from my standpoint, now Nance will have his own position here. <laughs> but no, I, I think that everything is meaningful. In fact, everything's so full of meaning that people can't even handle it. Um, but the, the issue is we don't know what to do with that meeting. We don't know how to navigate it and we don't know how to take any sort of ownership over it. We don't know how to figure out what's real or how to know what's true. And that's because we lack the educational basis. Um, and, and the structures for that kind of education are lacking because of the reasons I was just saying about the university and everything. So I think, yeah, at a point when people burn out, instead of nihilism, I'd just say pessimist, uh, it, black pill. People can go fully black pill. Yeah. Well, I said short term though. It's like the short term black pill for the sake of like, you know, you've got some optimism for something in the future. And the way I always talk about it is I am right now preparing myself to become the kind of person who will be able to write the book I think that needs to be written to parents of children who will be 25 and 30 years. Which is to say I'm giving myself five years to write a book to those parents. And then, of course, I want to be a part of these the, the development of these educational institutions that need to be built for the new century, and that's ultimately for their children. And if they don't have that, we're all screwed. Because we got born into this world, and everyone's like, oh, we already have it all figured out. And we're like, no, you don't. And the institutions are like, yeah, we do. And we're like, no, you don't. And in the meantime, we're like, so what should we do? And so this is our, this is our, this is what we're doing for now. I think we're unfortunately running out of time, but I still want to close with one more trivial question, which is, you guys were organizing a debate between Nick Land and Zizek. Yeah. And uh, we just have to mention that. So what's, what's, uh, what's the word? Your, your local uh, gadfly, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. We are in Ljubljana to not see Slavoj Zizek, actually. <laughs> we, we're only here for you, Vid. By the way, I, I don't think I mentioned he also wrote a foreword for uh, your book. Yeah, and, and we owe him a tremendous uh, debt and gratitude. And so, of course, when I say that we're here to not see him, it's not because we're like, fuck you, man. It's because he's like, ah, fuck you, I'm too busy, you know. And so we understand. He's, he is, he's sick and he's tired and he's old. And that's what he always says. But, no, he wrote a foreword to Time Energy. He also contributed an original piece for the Underground Theory volume, which Nance is also in, by the way. But uh, the question, though, was... Uh, what was the question? Uh, the debate between Nick Land and Zizek, how that's going, if it is going at all. Yeah, so we really want to see it happen. And for those who aren't familiar, 
uh, Nick Land is the father of accelerationism. He's an edgelord on the internet. But before he became that, he was probably the most important scholar on Kant and Deleuze in the world. And uh, a lot of people don't give him that credit. And he does, he did earn it, right? And he's also very important uh, for reading Bataille. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's kind of the other side of the internet. You know, it's Zizek and Land are the two sides of the theory internet. We have a fault line theory of the scene, which is to say that the major fault line was established in the 90s when the internet was new because there was, on the one side, the Slovenian school or the Ljubljana school, which is obviously Zizek's only the most popular one, there, but there's a bunch of others, including like Dolor and Zupancic, etc. On the other side is CCRU, uh, Cybernetic... Cultural Research Unit. I always get that mixed up. But yeah, yeah CCRU, Cybernetic Cultural Research Unit, uh, which comes out of Warwick University and includes others like Anna Greenspan and Sadie Plant. Robin and, McCain. Yeah. And so like that's going back to like get outside of the the sort of the great man version of history and realize that behind Zizek or Land is the Slovenian school or the CCRU, right? Like, of course, like they were instrumental, but they needed others being seriously engaged with what they were doing for them to be able to have the impact that they had. And they have shaped the entire scene, meaning that when you have someone like Badu or Graham Harmon or Todd McGowan or Chris Catrone, like almost any of these guys wouldn't actually be on our radar if it wasn't for them differentiating themselves from either Zizek or Land. And so these two guys are kind of the, like, if we want to go to, like, the central contradiction of the currently existing theory scene, we have to go to these guys. And so in December, when Slavoj Zizek came on to celebrate our one-year anniversary uh, at Theory Underground, uh, Mikey asked him at the end, hey, would you be willing to debate Nick Land? Because we'd introduced him to the existence of Land, and he had written an article about it. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, I would debate Land. And then, so we emailed Land about it, and then uh, he said, I'll get back to you after vacation, and then it's been five months. And I sent him a follow-up email saying, is vacation over? <laughs> and we don't know. We don't know. But I guess Zizek might have just won out the door, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. David, Nance, thank you both very much for coming to our radio. And I wish both of you good luck with the rest of your tour. Poslušali ste Subjekt mjeseca na Volovih radi še den. Z vami sem bil vid. In, ja, to je to. Živeli. Thank you so much. Thank you. In res. Ej, men ste bili ful fletano. Čak imam. Zakaj imamo luči? A nismo na radio. Ugasen. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately, liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture this scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. 
That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker, and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing. But first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world. But also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money and with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. With that said, several subscribers did not migrate from the now defunct app to the new setup, and I'm guaranteed to lose people over time. So please, if you want to get involved, become a subscriber. If you're not even sure what this is all about, but are just curious, then I've added tier zero and tier one for very basic kinds of access to what we are doing behind the scenes. If you don't have any time or energy to get involved, but you do have some money to help support this project from afar, then please check out the Patreon. My patrons over at Patreon make the podcast and public YouTube possible. Thank you. As for once-in-a-lifetime events, check out the new poster for the American Idiots Theory Underground European Book Tour. Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Vienna, Linz, Krakow, Glasgow, London, and Oxford from April 27th to May 25th, 2024. Two events are already fully booked out. Save a seat at an event by getting in contact with us ASAP. Finally, the call for proposals to our conference in Mexico on What's up everybody, TUCon 2024 update here. It's not happening in Mexico anymore, but it is still happening on October 24th through the 27th. The change was made because a lot of the people that wanted to attend and that were expected to attend said they could probably afford to travel if they had more time advance notice. Uh, so save up for June 2025. Uh, if you have to choose, right? Because yeah. uh, other, it, this one that is happening this year is happening physically in Boise, Idaho because we have a lot of collaborators and fellow travelers and co-instructors there. But you can attend virtually for this one. You won't be able to attend virtually next year. Um, so yeah, if you have to choose, attend physically in 2025. The call for proposals already happened. The writing workshop for proposals already happened. You can still get the links to both of those. Just shoot us a message and ask for those links. We'll get you those. And the form goes live on June 1st and the deadline is June 15th. So if you're attending physically, let me know ASAP. Get in on it. All right, finally, last little thing here is to say thank you so much to my patrons over at Patreon. The Patreon is for people who are too busy to be students or subscribers at Theory Underground, but who want to see more of this free content on the podcast and YouTube channel for Theory Underground. You are the ones who see something of value in the free content being made available here, and you want to see more of it. Your patron pledges at Patreon are a real motivator for me. So thank you so much. Especially thanks to Marilyn Lawrence, Bert Vanderkar, Carl Vanderlip, Nikolai, 
Sahil Kumar, Sexandra, Darian Large, Tyler Murphy, Max Mackin, Al, Algeri, Ben Rosenblum, Court Atlantic Airlines, Melis, Matt Payne, Neil C, Sammy Condon, Yiz, and Schwapkinson. Thank you.